Welcome everybody to our monthly um, lecture series on healing chronic pain and illness. I just want to remind you to turn your cell phones off and um, save your questions for the end, if you wouldn't mind. As you can see, we're being videotaped, and we videotape all our lectures, so it's going to be available on our website in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we have a lot of lectures on our website for, you know, for years we've been taping them. So um, kaplanclinic.com is our website, so it'll be available. Okay. I'm Dr. Lisa Lillianfield. I'm one of the practitioners at Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine down the street in McLean. And we practice functional medicine, which is a type of integrative holistic medicine looking at um, all aspects of health, including sleep and digestion and hormones and immune system inflammation and infections. Um, and more. Uh, so one of the things that we, one of the conditions we see quite often is Lyme disease. Antibiotics are pretty much the uh, treatment of choice, but there's always a concern for antibiotic resistant organisms developing and also the disruption of the beneficial bacteria in the gut uh, when you're on long-term antibiotics. So Tonight we're going to hear about treatments, alternative treatment to Lyme disease using herbal medicine. And we have here Rebecca Berkson. She is, um, has been with Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine for the last year and a half. She's board certified in acupuncture and oriental medicine and, and she's an herbalist. Um, she graduated, uh, she, did, had a mas she has a master's in science from Basir University in Seattle in oriental medicine, herbal medicine, and acupuncture, and as well as a master's in science uh, from the uh, Georgetown Physiology Complementary Alternative Medicine Program at Georgetown. Um, so please join me in a warm welcome for Rebecca Berkson. Thank you, Dr. Lisa, for that um, nice introduction. And uh, I, I feel very, um, you know, privileged to, to be at the Kaplan Center, um, you know, for the last year and a half, as Dr. Lisa mentioned. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I actually got into a car accident um, just yesterday evening on my way home from work, and um, it was a, a hit and run, not too much fun to deal with. Um, but uh, I, you know, show up to work today, and I knew everyone was going to take good care of me. <laughs> so um, I am a happy patient today. Um, so the, the topic um, of Lyme disease um, is, uh, is something, you know, as uh, Dr. Lisa said, I do acupuncture um, and Chinese herbs. Um, when I started at the Kaplan Center, I had been in Seattle um, prior to that, where Lyme disease just, it wasn't uh, as, as prevalent, um, possibly because of uh, underdiagnosis, but it was, just wasn't something that I, I saw. Um, so I started at the Kaplan Center and, and really struggled um, with patients who were um, suffering uh, very much from, from this disease. And, um, and so since then, I've really, um, you know, I've um, looked at a, a lot of literature. I've done a number of, um, of courses. And, and so this presentation is a culmination of a year and a half of research. Um, and I, I hope to be able to provide you a, maybe a little bit of a different perspective on Lyme disease. But first, I'm going to just do an overview from, um, you know, from a Western perspective. And then we'll go over the, the Chinese medicine. And uh, I'm going to bring up something called the uh, Gu syndrome, which is um, one specific model uh, within Chinese medicine um, that uh, has some promising uh, results. And, uh, and I'm going to end with fi finding a qualified practitioner um, who may be familiar with these. So Borrelia um, burgdorferi is the bacterial infection for Lyme disease transmitted through ticks. There's your tick. Something I, I uh, um, wanted to bring up, which is kind of interesting, is um, the very first patient who, who had Lyme disease is actually uh, over... 5,000 years old, 5,300 uh, years old. There was uh, um, the, an ice man um, that they called uh, Otzi, um, who was found in the, the um, Italian Alps. And, um, and so they did you know, a, a lot of tests on this you know, individual who was uh, in ice very shortly after he died. 
Um, and, and they found 60% of uh, the genome of Borrelia um, in his body. And so it's unclear whether he um, died of complications or if it was something that he had an infection throughout his life. Um, and uh, what's also really interesting about this particular um, mummy um, uh, is that um, he had um, carbon um, tattoos on his body. And, um, and they found that um, they uh, were actually, um, and, I, uh, and they're basically little lines throughout his body that are um, thought to be kind of a, a type of, of acupuncture, so for, for, uh, for pain relief. The, the spirochete you know, is from the bacteria, which is a spirochete. It's spiral shaped. It's uh, known for its motility. It's very fast. It's actually uh, faster than the fastest cell in the human body. Um, and it's uh, in the, uh, the family of, um, uh, of another bacteria that causes syphilis. And, um, and I, I, I'm going to bring up a, the term parasite. It's not something that we normally attribute to um, viruses or bacteria, but it's it, in the Chinese medicine literature, um, and especially the, the different categories of herbs, um, we refer to antiparasitic herbs. And, and um, so the definition of parasite is an organism that lives in or on another organism, its host, and benefits by deriving nutrients at the host's expense. Um, and so these do fall under that uh, category. So if you hear me using the word parasite, that's the, the context. So the, the infections do tend to hide throughout the body, which can make it difficult to treat. So a few other facts, and I bring these up because they're really important for treatment. The bacteria creates a, a biofilm, and these are uh, kind of a, it's a sticky substance where bacteria like to collect and, and to, to hang out. And, um, and the biofilms make it, um, it's, it's a big problem with, um, uh, um, you know, with like medical devices, um, but it's also a problem when it's inside of the body. So it's associated with chronic infections um, and uh, makes it difficult to treat. Uh, it makes it difficult for the antibiotic to reach the organisms. There's the Herx reactions, which is uh, worsening of the symptoms in response to a uh, release of, of an endotoxin when it dies off. And, uh, and it tends, it, it, it's uh, contracted with other co-infections. So um, uh, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Bartonella, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, these are also um, uh, in, an issue with patients uh, who get Lyme disease. Um, this is the, the life cycle. I'm going to not go over this because of time. The symptoms, so initially, there is sometimes uh, the bullseye rash, right, that um, we see, but sometimes, you know, 20 to 50 percent of patients may not actually get this rash. But there's also flu-like symptoms, so chills, fever, headache, muscle, and joint pain. Again, this is, this is going to be important when we talk about the, the Chinese medicine side of things, so remember these symptoms. Days, weeks after the infections, there can be additional rashes, uh, facial, Bell's palsy, headaches, neck pain, joint pain, shooting pain, dizziness. These are all classic signs you know, of, uh, of uh, Lyme disease, but you know, can be um, hidden right, from, uh, because there, there's plenty of other you know, things that can be attributed to. And then months or years after the infection, there can be arthritis or neurological uh, complaints. So the long-term symptoms, and this is where we get into uh, some territory that's very um, controversial. So 10 to 20 percent of people infected can have symptoms months to years after treatment, and it can be for a variety of reasons, and that includes the muscle joint pain, cognitive difficulties, sleep disturbance, and fatigue. And, um, and I've, I've listed some, some things that uh, are attributed to these longer term uh, symptoms, and some of them are directly related to the bacteria, others are not, like uh, the co-infection or just in general a weak, weak, weakened immune system um, or an autoimmune process or a chronic Lyme infection. 
diagnosis is done with symptoms, medical history, you know, whether you know, you've been exposed to ticks. And uh, the three main, there's others, but the three main tests that are, that are used are the ELISA, which is the antibody, it, it checks for uh, human antibody, antibodies against the Borrelia, and then um, Western blot and PCR, which is uh, for protein and DNA of the bacteria itself. Treatment, there's two main groups where that, um, that have guidelines for Lyme uh, symptoms. The uh, Infectious Disease Society of America, which treats uh, with one course of antibiotics usually, and they do not recommend uh, other treatments, including vitamins or nutritional managements, and that's straight from their guidelines. And I wanted to include that because what I'm talking about does fall under this category. So I just wanted to be clear. And then there's also the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. And they do more follow up with patients and, and um, different types of diagnosis. Again, this is uh, you know, very controversial. And uh, lastly, the alternative integrative group of which you know, I am a part of using both herbs and acupuncture, and we're gonna start talking about that in just a minute. But I wanted to bring up some of the challenges that patients have. There's a lot of confusing and conflicting information out there. People go to many, many different doctors, specialists, alternative care providers. Some of the patients that I see have been to 30 plus different specialists. Um, and some of them uh, tell them that there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And uh, a lot of um, money is being spent on medical care uh, out of pocket. There's uh, multiple medications and supplements, um, treatments uh, that can change on a weekly basis. And these, some of these folks are really reactive and sensitive to medications. And so they're dealing you know, constantly with these uh, you know, side effects. Um, and then, of course, when you do get a treatment that works, you're going to get worse, right? You have these Herx reactions, um, and you have to deal with that. So there's a lot of emotional tolls, including, you know, anxiety, depression. The disease also, you know, contributes to, and just dealing with the disease. A lot of people have to stop working. You know, friends and family don't understand. And then after undergoing multiple treatments, there's a subset of people who still don't get well. There's some people who do respond really nicely to, to medications. Um, and, uh, but you know, I'm talking about the people who after continually are still uh, struggling.